Thank you, brothers and sisters, fathers, ladies and gentlemen, for inviting me to speak to you today in defense of the book of Genesis, in defense of the first book of sacred scripture, the intellectual and rational foundation of our faith. It's the, it's the book that sets our worldview. It sets the biblical Christian worldview. Um, now this talk, I, just, I, I would call this a defense of the faith. It's an apologetic. Um, and I want to say that for apologetics, if you're going to be effective, you want an apologetic to be very easily understandable. You don't want to buffalo people when you do an apologetic. So this talk is going to be simple, straightforward, and clear. I want to talk about, first of all, what am I defending Genesis against? Well, basically, um, there is a theory rampant among the churches today and in the world called the documentary hypothesis, or sometimes called the JEPD theory, which asserts that Genesis, two, two basic things about Genesis. First of all, Genesis isn't really true. It's a myth. And it wasn't written by Moses. It was written by a series of unknown people over many, many centuries, maybe 900 or 1,000 years. And it goes something like this. Um, the book of Genesis, you know, if you look into the ancient Middle East, where Genesis obviously was arose from, you'll see that primitive people there had um, myths about the creation, about the flood, about the Tower of Babel and the scattering of languages that happened there. And basically, the theory is that some Hebrew redactors, editors, uh, borrowed from those myths, purified them in some sense, and adapted them to the Hebrew religion and put them down in the book of Genesis. In a simple term, what they're saying is, the Genesis is a patchwork. We take a little bit from here, and a little bit from there, and a little bit from here, and a little bit from there, and we put them together, and we've got this patchwork, of, especially for the first 11 chapters of Genesis, that sort of explain how the, the book came to be written down. And this happened over um, many centuries, probably ending around two or 300 BC, when the final product was in place. So obviously, if this is the case, two things are being claimed here. Moses did not write Genesis, and Genesis isn't really true. So in defense, in defense of this, in defense of the book of Genesis, I want to show two simple things in this presentation. I want to show that Moses wrote Genesis, and I want to show that Genesis is true. Two things, okay? I want to start out with some specifics about Genesis. The book of Genesis, we claim, I claim, has a certain literary unity to it. And that is something that is not necessarily obvious. So I want to start out with a simple, kind of a generalized outline of the book of Genesis. And I want to base this outline, I want to divide Genesis into nine sections, divided by the key phrase, generations of generations of. It repeats in the book. This is the generations of the heavens and the earth. This is the book of the generations of Adam. This is the book of the generations. There's, there are eight of these occurrences that I'm going to choose. And in these occurrences, if I choose them, but divide the book into nine sections. And I'm going to give you that outline right now. This is not totally arbitrary. It's not. Because the word that's translated generations of in Greek is Genesis. It's what we get the book's name from. So. Okay, so let's take a look at this. We have to go through this in some detail. So first of all, we have the story of the whole creation. This ends at Genesis 2-4 with these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. Then we have the story of Adam and Eve, 
their creation, temptation, fall, the judgments of God. They're cast out of the Garden of Eden. They have birth. They give birth to Cain and Abel. Then that story. Then Cain's Cain's family down to the seventh generation. And then we return to the godly line that Abel was killed. And the godly line picks up with Seth and Enosh. This ends at five one with these are the generations of Adam, or this is the book of the generations of Adam. The next section in our outline is a genealogy from Adam all the way down to Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, plus a short description of the tragic situation that prevailed on the earth just before the flood. This is what necessitated the flood. This ends at Genesis 6-9 with these are the generations of Noah. The next section talks about the building of the ark, the gathering of the animals, a rather detailed description of the flood, including some pretty specific chronology. Finally, they come to rest on a mountain they call Mount Ararat. They disembark. Uh, they offer sacrifices of thanksgiving to God. God promises there will never be another flood. Then they have the story about Canaan, the son of Ham. And then Noah blesses Shem and Japheth. And it ends with, these are the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, at 10.1. That's Genesis 10.1. The next section, well, let's took the page here, <clears throat> are the descendants, this is called the Table of the Nations, the descendants of Japheth, Ham, and Shem, those, not all of them, but those who specifically formed the nations and languages, language groups on the earth after the confusion at Babel. Then, following that, in chapter 11, we actually have the story of the confusion of tongues at Babel. This ends at Genesis 11.10, with these are the generations of Shem. The next is a genealogy from Shem all the way down to Terah and his three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And these end with, these are the generations of Terah at, 11, at 1127. Then we have a large section that tells us practically everything we know in the Bible about Abraham. It talks about Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, Lot, Ishmael, and it ends at 2519 with, these are the generations of Isaac. And then we have another section. It's the story of Isaac and Rebekah, their sons Esau and Jacob, especially Jacob. This, where Jacob goes to Padan Aram and deals with his uncle Laban, winds up getting four wives and a bunch of children, coming back, wandering around in Canaan for a while and eventually settling near his father Isaac. That ends at Genesis 37-2 with, these are the generations of Jacob. And then the last 14 chapters are stories about the descendants of Jacob. Some of them take place in Canaan, but some of them, many of them, eventually they extend into Egypt. And this ends the book. These are the nine sections. Now, this is a pretty wide variety of information in the book of Genesis. But we claim that there is a clear literary unity to this book. It's not a patchwork put together. And that's what we want to show. So we've divided Genesis into nine sections. You'll notice um, the first 36 chapters, sections 1 through 8, basically were written in the, in, the la in, a, in the linguistic and cultural milieu of ancient Babylonia. The last section, the last 14 chapters, starts out in Babylonia but ends up in Egypt and has more of an Egyptian flavor, therefore. Egyptian names, Egyptian place names, Egypt Egyptian customs. Okay? So... That's the book of Genesis now, okay? Now I want to start, I want to review this and realize that Genesis, obviously, being written in ancient Babylonia, most of it, uh, we need to look at 20th century archaeology and the ancient Babylonian writing. We say this with great ease today, but I want to say that 150 years ago, no one had any idea that the volume and quantity and quality of writing was available in those ancient times. In fact, back in the 1870s or 1880s, it was common to question whether there was writing at the time of King David. With the archaeological discoveries of the 20th century in the Middle East, we know there was writing at the time of David in 1000 B.C. 
There was writing at the time of Moses in 1500 B.C. There was writing at the time of Abraham when he was born in 1950-something B.C. There was writing 1500 years before Abraham in 33 and 3400 B.C. It was cuneiform and pictograph writing. We're going to talk mostly about cuneiform. I don't think the distinction there is necessary to be made. I want to say not only was there writing, it was common. We have found writing dressed to a man who was on business for a week from his wife. Hey, honey, pick up a loaf of bread while you're on the way home or something. I mean, no, casual writing. Casual writing. On the other hand, we found huge libraries filled with writing tablets with lessons of mathematics on them, with the lessons and the answers still in them. The long instructional lessons teaching mathematics to students. We have found in those libraries um, political writings, religious writings, business writings, accounting records. They were huge, thousands of tablets. We didn't even know there was writing until this was discovered in the 20th century. This is an amazing discovery. This is the milieu, the cultural milieu within which Genesis was written. So, here's the big deal. When you have libraries like that, there's a technical point. These, these writings were not being maintained on um, paper. They were on clay and stone tablets. You don't stitch tablets together like you do pages of a book. So, there was an issue here. When you have thousands of these, how do you organize and keep track of all the, the information in your big libraries? They had an area at the end of the book, at the end of a tablet called the colophon. The colophon had indexing data in it, had a lot of different possible data. But there's three kinds of data that we're going to focus on because it relates directly to the book of Genesis. First of all, they had something called an ownership line. This was <laughs> very common. The ownership line basically said who the authority was behind the data on that tablet. Now, tablets, there were scribes, and scribes would write tablets for people. The scribe's name was not the ownership line. It was the owner of the tablet. In other words, the person who came to the scribe and said, look, I've got this information, I want you to put it down. He's the owner of the information, the authority behind it. He's the name that's in the ownership line. Another thing would be the date of composition, or perhaps the date when it was completed, if it was completed over a period of time. So um, we'll talk about each of these in a little more detail as, as it becomes appropriate. The third one is something called catch lines. Now, we don't have catch lines today. We have page numbers. And they had tablet numbers then. But if you've got 1,000 documents, and each document has 20 pages or 20 tablets, tablet number two isn't very helpful. Which of the 1,000 documents is a tablet two for? So what they had was catch lines. And here's what a catch line is. The first document would have some kind of a key identifying phrase in it, something that would be unique to that document. The second document would repeat that as a catchphrase, connecting the two tablets. The next tablet, the third tablet, would take some key phrase from the second tablet and complete it and, and, and repeat it, a catch line. So in this way, the tablets were tied together, not just by page numbers or tablet numbers, but by catch lines. Okay. Now, this type of oh, here's here's a picture of a t of a typical. You might think these tablets are great big. You imagine your mind always imagine they're going to be like this. Look at that. That's a nice little tablet with cuneiform writing on it. You see, there's a kind of a clear band at the top, and then right above the clear band, there's a couple more lines. Those couple of lines at the top are the colophon. The reason they're at the top is because writing was from the bottom to the top, and it was at the end of the document, the end of the tablet. Okay. Okay, so that's a typical picture. Now, these techniques that I'm describing to you were uniformly and continuously available throughout the entire Middle East, the Babylonian area, but not Egypt. Egypt used, what did Egypt use? Pap papyrus, right? Papyrus, not clay tablets. So we didn't have this in Egypt. These techniques were unique, were specific to those cultures that wrote on clay and stone on stone tablets. And they were common throughout the Middle East from at least as early as 2000 BC until two or 300 BC. 
I tried to figure out why that eventually died out, and I don't know, but I'm going to make a guess. When Alexander the Great came in in 343, you know, Hellenized the Middle East, overlaid with Greek culture, I suspect that that probably was a death knell, and it, within a short time, the culture and the techniques died out. We're buried under the sands of the Middle East, and we're not discovered again until the 20th century when the archaeologist Spade uncovered it. Okay. Okay, so what's the connection to Genesis? Now let's look at Genesis. This key insight is credited to a British officer named P.J. Wiseman. P.J. Wiseman was an amateur archaeologist and a profound enthusiast. He had the providential blessing of being in the British Air Force during World War I and being assigned in the Middle East. So he was able to be present at the site of many of these digs as the great 20th century British archaeologists uncovered this fantastic stuff. And he saw firsthand what the writing looked like on these tablets. And immediately he was a devout Christian, one of the Plymouth Brethren, that tradition. And he saw the connection to Genesis. And he came back, and in 1936 he wrote a book called New Discoveries in Babylonia about Genesis. He was an amateur. It was the middle of the war. It was like he never wrote the book. Nobody even paid attention. But his son, Donald Wiseman, D.J. Wiseman, inherited his father's passion for archaeology, and he was not an amateur. He studied under the very finest British minds that there were and became one of the greatest Assyriologists in 20th century Britain. And that's saying a lot. D.J. Wiseman, in 1985, kind of reorganized and republished his father's book, and he called it Ancient Records and the Structure of Genesis. The information that I'm getting here is taken primarily from his work, although a few other archaeological backgrounds. So now let's look at the ownership line. What is it that P.J. Wiseman saw? Well, here's what he saw. The Hebrew word, let's go back to the generations line in our, our outline. These are the generations of. The Hebrew word for generations now, not the Greek word, the original Hebrew word was toledoth. Toledoth. It really means history. In particular, it means family history. So, if you saw something that said, this is the generations of Ishmael, and it was followed by a list of his sons, and his son's sons, and his son's son's sons, and his sons, you know, this sort of a schematic, that'd be one form of the history, the family history of Ishmael. That'd be one form. But you didn't have to take that form. It could take the form of just narrative stories. And um, so anyway, that's what the word means. So now let's just look at this for a second. Here are the ownership lines in Genesis. I want to skip sections one in our outline, sections one and nine. I'll come back to those. And I want to look at, just start with section two. So here we have the story of Adam and Eve and our creation. All the stuff that we said was in that section. It ends with, this is the book of the generations, Toledoth, of Adam. This is the book of the family history of Adam. Think about that. What you are seeing in this outline is exactly the family history of Adam. And this line, the fam well, this is the generations of Adam, is an ownership line. And it says, who is the authority behind this data? Adam. Who wrote this? Adam. That was the insight that he saw. Now let's test this hypothesis out by looking at Genesis in some detail. Okay? Evidence for the ownership line's insight. The sections two through eight, each section contains only material which the named owner at the end in that generation's line could have known from personal experience or from his immediate family members. There is never an example if you look at, this is the generations of Noah, 
This is the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is the generations. Everything that's there, this is the generations of Isaac. These are the generations of Jacob. Everything in each section is exactly what the named owner could have known from personal experience or from the immediate members of his family. It is indeed his family history. More. Second, most of those accounts extend until near the death of the owner of the account. As if he is writing the story of his life, often, and then ending near his death. Now, these, these things I'm saying here, you just have to go back and look at the book of Genesis and read it. It's right there in front of you to see. Now, I'll give you an exception to this. Uh, the, the, the story of the three sons and the, the, the story of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, that's the story of the flood, and that was obviously written to record the flood itself, not their whole life story. Okay, so there's an exception there, but there they were. Second, third thing, no account ever backtracks. But between accounts, there might be backtracking. So let me give you a very simple example of this. Isaac tells about his sons, Jacob and Esau, and how Rachel had a hard time getting pregnant and eventually gave birth to them. Then he goes on, he tells the rest of his story till near the end of his life. These are the generations of Isaac. Then when you start right after 2519 with what was supposedly Jacob's story, Jacob goes right back and he tells about his childhood from his own perspective. He tells about his childhood and how he deceived his father Isaac, and he tells how Esau got so mad at him and he had to leave and get out of there, he was going to get killed, and he tells his story from his position. But that kind of backtracking never takes place within a single account. So, very interesting. Now, you know, this kind of, kind of uh, analytical looking at the text of Genesis wasn't really started by D.J. Wiseman. It's an archaeological thing. Archaeologists do this. And actually, you know, people who have formulated the, the documentary hypothesis have a number of interesting analytical insights into the structure of the book of Genesis. We'll talk about those later. And we'll see what those insights mean in terms of our theory. Now, with this insight, I will make this simple statement. It is not plausible to believe that anyone could have written Genesis in this way at some later date. It is not reasonable to believe that. The evidence is consistent and it's overwhelming. And I haven't dealt with sections 1 and, and 9 yet, but I'm going to. And with that in view, I'm going to say the entire book of Genesis follows a pattern that testifies to the correctness of this hypothesis. And now I'm going to turn to some of the other sections. Let's look at section one. Section one is special because this is the generations of the heavens and the earth. There's no human being attached to that, no name. Well, not too surprising. No human being could have known what happened during those six days. Not by personal first, first-hand experience, he couldn't have. Nor from his family members. There wasn't anybody around. Only God was around. I'm going to hold that this was written by God himself. And I want to give some evidence for that by looking carefully at section number one. Okay? I want to look at this. Some detail. First of all, Jed, it's very clear that God himself did write with his own hands some parts of the Bible. Exodus 32, 16, Moses came down from the, from the mountain with the tablets of the law, and the tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on those tablets. So clearly, God did write something. But for further insight into the nature of this, I want to now turn to, we just talked about ownership lines, I want to now talk about date lines and how they appear, apply to Genesis. Now, date lines, because they were part of the colophon, tended to appear near the ownership line, okay? Examples of date lines in old Babylonian tablets, just to start with. <clears throat> okay, the year in which the throne of Nabu was made. The year Samuel, the king, built the wall of Sippar. The year in which Canal Hammurabi was dug. 
Statements like this would be followed closely by an ownership line. Okay. Now let's turn to the book of Genesis and look at some examples of date lines. Genesis 37.1, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is immediately followed by the line, These are the generations of Jacob. So this says that Jacob wrote his account when he was dwelling at Hebron, after he returned from Padan Aram with his wives, and after Isaac died. Here he is, right there in the land wherein his father was a stranger. Now he's going to write this. So what this is basically saying is, after all of his travels, when he was getting a somewhat older, his father was dead. He is now sitting there just, you might say, not very long before the famine hit and they went into Egypt. He wrote this. That's what this is saying. It's a typical date line. Second date line, he rested from all his work which God had created and made. This is Genesis 2.3. Followed immediately by the line, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. This tells us when God wrote his account. So God wrote his account on the seventh day when he was resting from his creation work. Now, that's why it does not say evening and morning the seventh day. And when I read this, I thought, this is really interesting because as I began to talk about my beliefs about Genesis, I've had people say to me, oh, Mike, you know, the, the days of Genesis are long periods of time where we're still in the seventh day. You know, it hasn't ended yet. No evening and morning of the seventh day. We're still in it, right? Eh, no, not so. The seventh day was blessed by God. This time in history is under a curse. No, the reason it doesn't say evening and morning the seventh day is because God wrote it in the middle of the seventh day and it wasn't over yet. So he wrote this on the seventh day and gave it to Adam right away as an instructional tool to teach Adam about how he came to be. These are very important things. Adam need to know, need to know this just as much as we need to know this. How did I suddenly wake up and I'm here? Where did this whole world come from? You know, we take stuff like this for granted. We grow up from a little child and become gradually aware. Adam just, there he was. What happened? God told him, and he used this as an instructional tool. Now, I want to look at this very carefully from the archaeologist, archaeologist's point of view. I want to look at the first tablet, and some of Dr. Wiseman's archaeologi archaeologist's comments on this tablet. I'm just going to read his words because they're very insightful. Naturally, the wording is simple, but the truth conveyed is profound. Human as the language is, it is still the best medium God could use to communicate with man. It is God teaching Adam in a simple yet faultless way how the earth and the things which he could see on and around it had been created. The Lord God talked with Adam in the garden. This tablet purports to be a simple record of what God said and did. It is God teaching the first man the elemental things about the universe at the very dawn of human language. These words were spoken to the first man. This is not a vague or general account. All the reader needs to do is to realize its unique features and to compare it with those other Babylonian versions, those ancient myths that supposedly Genesis was derived from. It's nothing like them. Now let's look at some of the differences here. He highlights some of these differences. Here in this account, we get back to the very inauguration of written history, for it may have been written even before the sun and the moon had been given names. The book says, let there be lights in the firmament. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Then Dr. Wiseman, from his archaeological background, observes that names for the sun and the moon were some of the most ancient names of all cultures in the world. If this account had been written within the context of any of those cultures, it would not be saying the lesser light and the greater light. It would have been saying whatever the name for their, their name for the sun was or whatever their name for the moon was. But it doesn't say that. It's not just what it says. It's what it doesn't say. A trained archaeologist used to reading ancient documents sees things like this. So this book, so this was written before 
names had been given to the greater and the lesser lights. Let's go on with his comments. This first chapter is so ancient that it does not contain mythical or legendary matter. These elements are entirely absent. It bears the markings of having been written before myth and legend had time to grow, and not, as is often stated, at a later date when it had to be stripped of the mythical and legendary elements that were inherent in every other account of creation in the Middle East. This account is so original that it does not bear a trace of any system of philosophy. It is so ancient it contains nothing that is merely nationalistic, neither Babylonian, nor Egyptian, nor Hebrew. Because it was written before clans, before nations, before philosophies originally, surely we must regard it as the original of which the other accounts are merely corrupted copies. Others incorporate their national philosophies in crude polytheistic and mythological form. This account is pure. Genesis 1 is as primitive as the first man. It stands at the threshold of written history. Now these are insights from Dr. Wiseman from the, archaeological, from the perspective of the trained archaeologist. I think they are excellent. Now I want to look at the relationship between the first and the second accounts. The second account supposedly written by Adam, the first one written by the Lord. Now this is where some very thoughtful observations uh, in the documentary hypothesis, they note that as you pass from the creation account to the story of Adam and Eve, the name used to refer to God changes. In the Hebrew, it changes from Elohim to Yahweh or Yahweh Elohim. From God to the Lord or the Lord God. Okay. Now, this name change has been used in the documentary hypothesis to uh, undergird their patchwork theory of Genesis. What we have here is two different creation accounts melded together, and you can tell that they're two different authors because they are two different names for God. So, But one of the things the documentary hypothesis does not explain is, well, why the name change? Why? What's the significance of that name change? But you see, in our position, it's very clear. When God wrote his account, he called himself God. When Adam wrote his account, he wrote it from the perspective of a creature, not the perspective of the creator. And he called God the Lord, or the Lord God, because that's who he is in relation to Adam. Of course he called him the Lord God. Furthermore, in the temptation scene in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent does not use Yahweh or Yahweh Elohim. He uses Elohim. Because he does not recognize God as his Lord, that rebellious one. And you know what? As the account goes on, you see that Eve uses the word Elohim too. She's kind of called away. I think it's kind of a sign of what was going on there. Okay? But the rest of the account uses Yahweh or Yahweh Elohim to refer to God. This makes a lot of sense. Here's another fact, another shrewd observation in the, the made in the JEPD theory. Um, certain places in Genesis, there are repetitious statements. And by I mean repetitious, I mean one, a statement will say something, and a second statement will basically say the same thing again in slightly different words, and maybe even a third one. I'm going to give you an example of this. And now, 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 just once again, giving some explanation here from the documentary hypothesis, this theory would say, well, you see, this is because there are three accounts melded together here. And these three accounts were kind of clumsily edited. The person who did the editing didn't remove the duplicate statements. And so it's kind of a clumsy work. This is a word they like to use, clumsy. Clumsy editing work here. That's how we, the Genesis got put together the way it did. But let's, let's look at an example of this. This is an example. Genesis chapter 7, verse 18, The waters prevailed and were increased, increased greatly upon the earth. Genesis 19, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. Genesis 20, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail. Now these are obviously saying about the same thing, 
three times, three successive statements. But this phenomenon is only found in the section that is signed Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It had three authors. This particular phenomenon of two or three, account, three statements in a row like this is only found in their section. No place else in the book of Genesis. Well, of course, we have three authors here. What do you expect? Of course, you can imagine the, the sons are in the ark. The waters are rushing over the land. They've never seen anything like it. And the first one says, wow, the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the second son says, yeah, the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And the third one comes along and says, yeah, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail. No doubt about it. They were all very impressed by what they saw and they all wrote their sentence. But it's not like you have three accounts melded together. You have one account with three authors. Okay, this is what's going on. Okay, now let's look at the final section. The final section, as we said, started out in the land of, in Babylonia, in Canaan, and wound up in Egypt. The final section has no generations line at all. It has Egyptian words and names. And we just make this note. It comes after jo Jacob's section. Now remember, Jacob's section was written before, just before the famine hit and he went into Egypt. So if we look at this last section, it's stories about the descendants of Jacob. Most reasonable is this. Jacob went into Egypt. When he did, the, this last section had not yet been written. And while in the land of Egypt in Goshen, his descendants wrote these other stories down, written by his descendants in the land of Egypt. Some of them related what happened to them in Canaan. Most of them related what happened to them in the land of Egypt, in Goshen, as the time wore on. That's how those are written down. But they were written on papyrus. And the Babylonian style of technique of writing wasn't available then. It wasn't, it wasn't what was practiced. So they just wrote it in, in, on a papyrus in, in Egyptian form. That's why there's no generations line. That's why there's no ownership line. That's why these key stylistic indicators are absent. Okay? All right. This accounts for all nine sections of Genesis, section by section. It tells us who, by whom, how, and why the information in Genesis was originally written down. Every bit of it. The original documents, brothers and sisters, from which this arose, are lost to us probably forever. We're never going to find them. But their outline is still clearly available and visible in the book of Genesis. These original nine documents, if you will, from which Genesis was written, I call the Genesis documents. These are the documents from which the present book of Genesis was written. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how these documents wound up in Egypt, I want to re-emphasize it, and how Moses got a hold of them and how he wrote it down. First of all, when you think about this, this is family histories. We have here a series of family histories, a sequence of family histories. Obviously, logically, a person would want to pass this on to his descendants. What else is he writing it? But there's more to it than just that sort of logic. There is actually stylistic, clear stylistic evidence from within the text of Genesis that this is what was going on. And that's where we come to the area of catch lines. I want to give you some examples of catch lines that appear in the book of Genesis. And I just want to show how these catch lines clearly connect together God's section and Adam's section and then Adam's section and Noah's section, okay? So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the catchphrase. Now, that ends with, this is the account of the heavens and the earth. That's the end of God's account. And then Noah's, or Adam's account starts when it says, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. 
Now we have Lord God, that's Adam's name for God. And up there we have God created the heavens and the earth. Lord God made earth and heaven. There's your catchphrase. Now I want to show you another catchphrase. The one in green, this is the account of the heavens and the earth. So Adam starts out and says, when they were created. And then you'll see that down here in Noah's account, 5-2, right after the name, the, the ownership line for Adam, he says, he created the male and female, blessed them and named a man in the day when they were created. There you are with that catchphrase. Now here's the thing about catchphrases. Sometimes you make a catchphrase, if you're clever, that fits the logic of your sentence. Like the one that, that Noah made, it kind of fits his sentence. But the one up there that Adam made, look at how awkward that is. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. That is definitely kind of an awkward ling human language construction. It's, it's repetitious. Once again, the observation of this kind of awkwardness in the text of Genesis was seen as a reason for believing that we had multiple accounts being patched together in a somewhat clumsy way. But we don't, we understand though that that's not what this is. This is a, this is a striking example of the type of literary techniques that were available and used throughout the Middle East in the culture where Genesis was put together. Dr. Wiseman actually lists a complete set of catch lines showing that each section is pointedly connected to the one that precedes it, except the last section, which is another style of writing. So the first eight sections are completely connected by these catchphrases. Now, there are conclusions to be drawn from that, and I want to draw these conclusions. So back to the documentary hypothesis. Um, as I said, this, um, this was evidence of multiple accounts blended together by a clumsy redactor. But now, their theory, you realize, was formulated in the 1800s before these archaeological discoveries were made, before any real understanding was in place about the ancient Babylonian cultures. So they jumped the gun in their theory there. So I want to draw some inferences from the catch lines. First of all, because there are explicit catch lines there, we can say that every single time that an owner wrote his section, he had the previous section before him. And he pointedly, by what he wrote down, connected his section to that one. Therefore, we can say the tablets certainly were being passed down through the generations, and the patriarchs were intentionally writing so as to create a cumulative history of events going back to Adam and the creation. Because they were pointedly appending their section to what was written before by this catch line. That was the literary technique. So here's some interesting observations. When Abraham left Haran after his father Terah died, he carried with him the accounts by the Lord, Adam, Noah, the sons of Noah, Shem, and his father Terah. He carried those accounts with him. And the reason he waited until his father Terah died was not because he was weak in faith and slow in obeying God's command. It was because it was his birthright to inherit those tablets as the chosen one of God. And he didn't inhabit the, inherit them until his father died. So when his father died, he left. Second, when Jacob left Canaan for Egypt at the time of the famine, he carried with him all of the accounts going back to Adam and the creation, except for the ones which the sons of Jacob added while living in the land of Goshen in Egypt that finally brought all of the source documents to completion, the whole set of the Genesis documents. So here they are. All of these things, these writings, most of them in Babylonian technique, a few, the end, in Egyptian style, and they're there in the land of Egypt. And that's how they wound up there. Uh, a couple of centuries later, Moses comes along. Now, what does the Bible tell us about Moses? First of all, Moses was educated in all the learning of Egypt. Gen Acts 7.32, this is Stephen's testimony before the Sanhedrin, before he was martyred. 
Now, it is known from archaeology that the Egyptian scribes in those days commonly copied Babylonian tablet data back and forth to and from their papyrus. So this, this was something that was known. So if Moses was educated in all the learning of Egypt, he knew how to do this. Second, by faith, Moses preferred his Hebrew ancestry and the promises of God to the passing pleasures and glory of Pharaoh's court in Egypt. That's from the book of Hebrews. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What word of God was there? Moses' Hebrew history was there for him to read. It was sitting right in front of him. All he had to do was read it. Think about what it says. When Hebrew says, by faith Moses preferred, think of it. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's court. He might have been an heir to the throne of Egypt, for all we know. He was certainly situated at the pinnacle of Egyptian power. And yet, he did not identify with that. He identified with a downcast slave race that was being systematically exterminated. Why would he do that? Only by the supernatural grace of God. That's why Hebrews says, by faith, he did this. It's not what you would do normally. So Moses read the Genesis documents. The Spirit of God came upon him. He understood. He knew that they were the true account of origins. Moses could understand Babylonian writing styles as well as Egyptian. And so Moses edited the Genesis documents that he had before him, the family records of his Hebrew ancestors, and he did it for his fellow Hebrews. He put them, he followed Babylonian literary practices as known to the Hebrew scribes and kept the ancient ownership lines, some date lines, some catchphrases, to show them what was going on. He dis did this intentionally, just as nowadays when you write a book, you credit your sources with endnotes. He did this to credit his sources, to show what the source of his data was. He did this intentionally as a scholarly record to his Jewish people who would need to understand the vital truths of creation and the original sources from whom that origination, that, that data had come. The Israelite scribes, because Babylonian writing style was known throughout the ancient Middle East, I believe the Old Testament Jewish scribes knew what Moses did, and they understood what they were seeing in Genesis. They knew Moses wrote the book, but they knew he did not ever claim to be the original source for the information in that book. Moses wrote in the known style of those times, intending to make that clear. That is, the Israelite scribes knew that Moses was the final redactor or editor of the book of Genesis. Now, from 20th century archaeology, we know this. Moses wrote Genesis, and this is how he did it. That's one of the points I wanted to show. But there's more. The genre of Genesis. Is Genesis properly classified as a myth? No. Genesis is historical narrative. More precisely, personal family history. Here's what I mean by this. Think about this. This is, of all narratives, the most reliable and the most certain. Look, let me give you an example. Suppose you take a look at the history of Western culture written by Toynbee, a magnificent work. But any history scholar worth his salt would look at that and could probably find dozens or hundreds of points where he would disagree with or dared to disagree with Toynbee. It's just not certain. But... Suppose that besides that book, Toynbee sat down and wrote a simple story about how he and his wife raised his children over a period of 20 or 30 years and what they did on their family vacations and how they lived their life. And he wrote that, his family history. Who would argue with it? Who could? It's his own story and the story of his wife and his children. How could you argue with it? Genesis is a series of first-hand personal family records written by men who, with their families, 
lived through the key formative events at the beginning of human history and wrote that down for their descendants. And God has carefully preserved that for us. And he has preserved the, the, the literary techniques that identify it for us and the literary styles that make it clear providentially. He has preserved that for us in Genesis. Therefore, Genesis is true. Genesis is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God, like all of Scripture. That's what we wanted to show. Moses wrote Genesis, and Genesis is true. Now let's draw a few simple deductions from this. You know, brothers and sisters, one of the things that we do here is we point out the horrible fables in various theories of origins that are being purported in our culture today. And we do a good job of it. I can tell you, the Foundation Series does a real good job in what it presents. But um, when you prove that those theories aren't quite right, or aren't right at all, that doesn't thereby prove that Genesis is true. It just proves that the cultural roadblock that has been established to keep people from being able to believe in Genesis is nothing. It's not right. This actually shows that Genesis is true. And if Genesis is true, then those theories cannot be true. This is important because the fathers of the church, when doing apologetics, said, well, what do you base your apologetics on? As Augustine said, nowhere better yet found than the word of God. So proving that the Genesis is true, demonstrating its accuracy, gives us a very solid foundation for doing apologetics and for believing at this time that Genesis is true and that, that the, book of, the first book of the Bible is accurate. You know, in a lot of ways, this is not complicated. This is a very simple, straightforward, and clear presentation. It's not real, you know, anybody can understand this. I consider this to be an answer to the prayer that I sent up to the Father at my desk at work when I said, Father, there has to be an apologetic for this. It has to be simple, straightforward, and clear, and I need to know it. I think this is his answer. But it's more than that, brothers and sisters. It's more than that. It's not just for me. It's for the church. It's a sign of the perspicacity of God who understood before the foundation of the world, as Father so explained to us, what was going to happen and planned accordingly. And in his one unified word of creation, he saw this problem that we would be facing at this time in history. And he so designed his inspiration of Moses, and he so designed the cultures of the Middle East and their literary styles, and he so arranged for the 20th century archaeology so that at this time in history, we could see, buried in the text of Genesis for anybody to see, the irrefutable evidence that Moses wrote Genesis, that Genesis is a series of first-hand personal accounts, and that Genesis, therefore, is true. It's the perspicacity of God, right? Perspicacity. Okay. God bless you, brothers, sisters. Um, I was going to say, uh, there is a more complete treatment of this. This is such an overview I've given here. Uh, the Mosaic Authorship of Genesis, which is on our website, has a somewhat more complete explanation um, of this, a little more detail. But the most complete treatment will be in my book, The Genesis Documents, which is a commentary in the book of Genesis. Each section of those nine sections commented on with hundreds of, of quotes from the fathers of the church showing that this understanding of the writing of Genesis and the Father's thinking fit together just like this. And that's why the book is called The Genesis Documents, Undergirding the Truth of Genesis and the Ancient Faith of the Church. And in that, I, I have um, a lot more information about this theory and a lot more thought about it. So, okay, well done.